you must have minimum losses while allowing for unlimited gains and not just the opposite. There's a lot of trading systems out there that make a little bit, make a little bit, make a little bit, make a little bit on a fairly accurate basis. If, if somebody shows you a system and they're like it's 80% or 90% or even more correct, you need to look at how much money they're making and then you need to play devil's advocate and see how bad it is when they get whacked. I saw somebody's returns the other day these people that are bragging about how great they are, these YouTube gurus, and they were brave enough to show what they claim to be actual returns, and they had a 30% whack in one month. Who's to say you don't have two 30% down months back to back? That's pretty scary, okay? Not that you won't have losses. Trend trading, you have a lot of losses. We'll talk about that in just one second. But the bottom line is you have to make sure you're able to occasionally knock it out of the park. So just a quick example. This was one from last week. Week This is Tia. And you could see I was able, this is like an eternity in crypto. Uh, way back last November, November, December, January, and then where did I finally get out? Uh, February, March. So it was like five months or so. And this, <laughs> Monday, Thursday, Thursday, Wednesday. That's what it sounded like. You can't eat like a bird and shit like an elephant. And that's what a lot of these little reversion to the mean type of systems do, selling options for one, for instance, naked options. I get more former reversion to the mean type traders than all the other methodologies combined when they come to me. So that's kind of a that's kind of an interesting thing but you can't eat like a bird and shit like an elephant that's an old commodity adage and you can go broke taking a profit and that's exactly how a lot of people do go broke now william eckert comes to mind the desire to maximize a number of winning trades or minimize a number of losing trades works against the trader the success rate of trades is the least important performance statistics and may be inversely related to performance and I don't know what my percent correct is. I don't think it's fantastic. I can tell you that. But as long as I catch, as long as I catch a decent winner every now and then, I don't get too caught up in that. And I think Eckerd went on to say, or someone else like Eckerd, like Dennis, Richard Dennis or someone, that what feels good over the short term doesn't really work longer term. And that's kind of hard to wrap your head around. When you first get started trading, you're just craving that little quick, that little quick gain a little quick dopamine rush and that's that's not how it works longer term that's not how any of this works so you will be wrong a lot that's one thing you have to wrap your head around and often and even when you're right you're wrong a lot and along those lines is a trend follower and by the way the only way to make money is to capture a trend so the bottom line is when I don't care what your trading type is, as soon as you become profitable in that trade, you have become a trend follower because that trend has begun to develop. But as a trend follower, you're gonna spend a lot of your time, the majority of your time, less wealthy. And people a lot smarter than me have brought this point up, including Robert Frey. I think he's got a doctor in mathematics or something. I forget what fund he was with. Is it the quantum fund or one of those funds that made a bazillion percent return or whatever but anyway uh, one of my clients years ago sent me a youtube on him you could probably still find it and he said you spend 75 percent of the time in a state of regret in other words draw down now here's something that maybe we could back into just for a second the Neurology of trading i talk a lot about the psychology of trading but the neurology of, neurology of trading easy for me to say is very important too. And the biggest thing there, in addition to our brains having caught up to modern society, we still have a bit of a caveman brain sloshing around up there. But the biggest thing is that the emotion attached to a loss is twice the emotional reaction as the emotion attached to a gain. My, my daughter wanted to go to, she, my daughter likes to gamble as long as my money. <laughs> That's another story. But she was in town for her birthday and she wanted to go to the casino. So we're like, yeah, whatever, that, that's fine. And, uh, and I'm in the bathroom and some guy comes in, comes in there and he's all bummed out. He's like, I gotta go, I gotta go make it back. And I'm going like, Ugh. 
That's why casinos are doing so well because they know you're feeling so bad about that loss. You just want to you just want to get that high again. You want to chase that high, and chasing that high is what leads to gamblers' ruin. So I think with trading, if you understand the neurology of that, that you're going to be in a state of regret, draw down a lot, and that's going to hurt and that's going to suck. So whenever you feel really good about trading, just just be patient. You're about two minutes away from your next drawdown. That's one of the few things I can guarantee. Greg Morris once pointed out that markets only make new highs 4% of the time. And I put that in trading full circle. So one thing you have to remember is even on favorable moves, markets will spend a considerable amount of time backing and filling. Now this chart's a little dated and I'll show you one that's actually a live trade here in just a second. But I thought it'd be fun. I know you're going to party with me, but I wanted to show you when it's making new closing highs and when it's backing and filling. And, and I forget the exact stats on this, but just eyeballing it, I would say 90% of the time you are giving up open profits. And that's why trading hurts a lot. Okay. But wrapping your head around that and accepting that and learning how to live with that is key. And if you can't do it, then Trade at such a small size, it's nearly meaningless. And that's why I'm having so much fun with crypto, printing money, okay? Because it's a small account and I don't care. It's not going to change my lifestyle if my crypto account blew up tomorrow. When I had an offshore account in crypto, which they, uh, the government no longer allows KuCoin in the United States, but KuCoin was great and you could leverage up and do all kind of crazy stuff over there. That's I had a lot of fun with that until the account started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Then then the old psychology starts to rear its ugly head and everything, as I alluded to earlier. But anyway, as you can see, most of your time, as Mr. Frey pointed out, you're going to spend in a drawdown the stock or whatever other market is backing and filling. So as I mentioned previously, it's harder than it looks. Sometimes the map is not the territory. I could say, hey, go out and trade this Landry Light pullback. Pretty easy thing to recognize, pretty easy thing to do. Here's the money management, knock yourself out. And you look at 100 charts, it's like, man, this thing works great. I love this thing. And then when you try to do it in real time, it's like, wait a minute, I'm losing money day after day after day after day. I better just get out. And then what happens? The market takes off without you. Not all the time, but quite often. Anyway, it's harder than it looks, even in good time. So here's a live example I'm talking about. So we got in this trade way back last July. So Brian earlier was asking me, hey, do you just day trade or do you still swing trade or whatever? Well, I've always been a swing trader. And then I've always held positions as long as they've moved in my favor. And I judge that by not being stopped out. When I'm stopped out, I'm stopped out. I forget exactly what a stop is. And this one's probably down here somewhere now. And I allowed that to loosen up over time. I think we talked about that last week. But anyway, you can see it just kind of went sideways for a while. So you just stay to draw down. And I think I missed this one right here. But right here, you can see you're feeling really good. You know, it, and then if you look at this on an intraday basis, you're up here. OK, and this thing went up, let's say, let's just say 55 to 60 something like eight points. OK, whatever that is. So you're feeling good. It's up. you're up eight points and then you go to lunch or whatever and you come back in and this thing has dropped four points on you okay so you're still up four points for the day but you just lost that four points so now all of a sudden instead of feeling good you're feeling a little eh, not so hot kind of backing into something here that's one reason you don't want to watch every little zig and zag on a chart or that'll make you crazy literally anyway you can see you know great day here bam off to the races you come in you're up three points you're feeling good you know you start boat shopping <laughs> And then what happens, the market comes right back in. And lately we've been kind of drawing down a little bit once again. So notice that there's not that many new highs in here, okay? There's a new high, there's a new high, there's a new high. There's what, a half a dozen, maybe maybe 10 or 12, okay? And how many trading bars are there in here? Quite a few, okay? So, and, and I guess right here you had quite a few highs, but even within these highs, intraday at least, it's pulled back quite a bit especially like this day here, you're feeling good and it comes back in. So you get the idea. You spend a lot of time less well.